Awesome. In the meantime, they just stole half my lecture, just so you know. <laughs> Good morning. And welcome students, my future, or formal, also known as colleagues, faculty and administrators. I have a special connection to Palmer College. In my wildest dreams, on graduation day in 1986, a long time ago, I could not have predicted that I would one day be a trustee. It's a high honor. And with that recognition, combined with today's invitation to speak to you, it couldn't be more appropriate. I've always been an ardent supporter of women. With my appointment as trustee, I joined the Palmer Women's Institute in the belief, which you just heard, that female chiropractors have unique gifts, needs, and opportunities. The Institute was created to advance, support, and inspire not only future chiropractors, but current female chiropractors through education, mentoring, and professional development. This is a cause I support. And I'm here today to help you understand the essential principles of how I've come to this position. It seems this era finds us focus kind of on a renewed interest in supporting women. Of course, this year in 2017, Palmer College dedicated the Palmer Women's Institute. In late 2016, I became a founding member and a board member of a nonprofit organization launched by female chiropractors. Does the timing of these two events signal that all of a sudden people realize the value of women in chiropractic? Why are we still asking this question? 
Do we need nonprofits dedicated to promoting the careers of women in chiropractic? I would argue yes. We do need these organizations and institutions. <clears throat> because as the number of women in chiropractic increase, we must position ourselves to be more supportive of one another. Does this mean we are still working to prove ourselves worthy in our profession? Obviously, we do have smaller frames. And yes, occasionally we are less muscular than men. However, this does not mean we've lost our ability to measure up. Frequently, I do muscle comparisons in the mirror with my husband, just to see who has the most definition. And by the way, I win. <laughs> In fact, 13 years ago, the University of Victoria released their research on the force applied by female and male chiropractors during thoracic spinal adjustments and found there was no significant difference between male and female chiropractors for the measurements in the upper thoracic area. This research was published in the JMPT in 2004 and concludes from a mechanical point of view female chiropractors produce similar manual treatments as their male colleagues. Let me repeat this. They found that female chiropractors are just as able as their male colleagues. The subject is closed. <laughs> However, we still find ourselves left out of opportunities. How can we have more influence? How can we ha experience more success in the field of chiropractic? So it makes me curious and it kind of makes me want to roll up my shirt sleeves and dive in like how can I influence this? How can I create change? How can I, oppor excuse me, how can I identify opportunity for growth and opportunities for women chiropractors? For the men in the audience, you may think the next 30 minutes or so is going to be male versus female, not so. When I reach the call to action, you will see that I am advocating for principles that help every person succeed. Throughout my career, participating and volunteering on different boards, I have worked with men much more than I have women. But I am most passionate about success for women because I'm a woman. And because I realize I have a responsibility to help women succeed. I'm equally excited for all people who want to have an impact in chiropractic. So first, let me tell you how I got here. Chiropractic had a significant influence in my family. In fact, I am number 13 of 22 chiropractors in my family. Graduating on Friday, June 13th in 1986. Today is November 13th. And last night, my hotel room was 713. I'd say 13 is my lucky number. My mom is the second oldest of 12 children. She was born in this country in 1926, but never spoke English until she had to learn when she started school. My maternal grandparents were from Yugoslavia. From their 12 children, they had 36 grandchildren. Kind of a big family. So when their daughters finished sixth grade, my mom and her sisters, eight girls and four boys, they had to quit school because they were female and did not need an education, at least in my grandparents' view. My dad, on the other hand, did not come to this country until after World War II in 1949 when he was 28 years old. And English was his fifth or sixth language. He was from the Ukraine and had spent nine years in Germany during the war. He had explained to us he went to like a Catholic school, um, probably like through the junior high level. So now maybe m you and my colleagues understand why I say verbs before nouns, because I've heard it all my life. Uh, all the sentences are spoken backwards. But my dad arrived to this country with like a small suitcase, very little money, and he stayed with an aunt and uncle for his few, first few years. My parents had a 20-acre vegetable farm and worked in small factories. As kids, we were so happy to go to school. It was like so much easier than being home. <laughs> 
you know, you don't know the fun you've missed unless you go out in the field and in an hour and a half you get to pack, pick 90 packs of tomatoes with your mom. Then you go to the barn and you clean them and sort them according to size and quality. You guys are missing all the fun. <laughs> so my mom and dad worked hard. They raised four children, built a new home, and had no debt by the time they were in their early 50s. All with limited education, but with an attitude that they instilled in us that if you work hard, be honest, live below your means, and take a little risk, you will prosper in this great country. In fact, my dad's favorite saying, and especially when I was in chiropractic college, just keep on trucking, meaning keep working hard and pushing forward towards your goals. When someone comments on phys how physically hard my position or the work I do as a chiropractor must be because I'm small, I tell them, compared to lifting a bushel of cabbage or cucumbers or dragging a burlap bag of five dozen ears of corn, are you kidding? This is easy peasy. So the large guys in my office that come in, usually they look at me and say, oh my gosh, you're so little, how are you going to do anything? Or the other more common reaction is like, oh, thank goodness you're little, you're not going to hurt me. So that's kind of what I get uh, with the size thing. So because my parents didn't have an opportunity to go to school, we were strongly encouraged to continue our education and take advantage of the ability to be able to do that. They always said, you can pay tuition for your education or you will pay for your education through heirs in life that will cost you money, but you will learn. So my mom's closest sister, Aunt Mary, and her husband, Ray Elwert, came to Davenport with three children so he could go to Palmer School of Chiropractic. Uncle Ray had had a great experience with a chiropractor in the late 1950s. He had narcolepsy after being um, in the Korean War. But not only a chiropractor did he go to, but a female chiropractor. So he graduated in 1962 and started the legacy of chiropractic in our family. So when we were injured or sick or visiting Uncle Ray, he was always the first doctor that checked us out and evaluated us. Their youngest child is Dr. Cindy Schaff Toll, and she and I are the same age. Actually, we're only five days apart. So we spent tons of our growing up years staying each other at each other's home. I would stay at her house on spring break and holiday vacations, and she was one of the many cousins that would come and stay at our house during the summertime to work on, on the farm. So I can remember, I was probably, I don't know, 11 or 12 years old, and I was um, at Aunt Mary and Uncle Ray's, and Cindy and I worked in the office, and we got to take patients back to the treatment rooms. It was like, yay, we have a real job, and it was just so cool at that age. But all through junior high and high school, I spent um, coming out to Palmer homecomings with their family because Uncle Ray never missed a Palmer homecoming. He came every single year. In fact, one year he owned BJ's Cadillac and we had the opportunity to bring that back for homecoming. Um, so all this time spent with my uncle and my cousin and the rest of the family and all the Palmer events I attended was very influential on my decision to become a chiropractor in high school. You need to know that Uncle Ray promoted chiropractic and people going to chiropractic college, especially Palmer, like no one I have ever known. He was active. He would set up all these potential student things in Michigan, like come and listen to this speaker, and you know, if you're thinking of going to school, come to our house. And he would set up huge events and halls with um, inviting patients and anybody you knew. He would have people you know, like Reggie Gold come in and speak. And at one point, my cousin figured out that her dad was responsible for sending 50 people it to Palmer and making that decision to be a chiropractor and go to school here. After I graduated from Palmer, I always had a family-oriented practice. Um, you know, I encourage patients to have their children checked when they experience the normal falls and injuries. Since I had grown up with chiropractic care, I knew how important it was for children to be adjusted, and I used myself for an example. I mean, my x-rays now look better than most of my patients that are 20 years younger as far as arthritic changes. 
But my education in chiropractic expanded into chiropractic pediatrics when Palmer and the ICA came out with the first DICCP program. So I was in that first class that started in um, 93 and I finished in 96. So by this time, I was heavily invested and committed, heart and soul, to not only chiropractic, but especially pediatric chiropractic. But I felt it was time to make a bit of a difference and to commit to investing my time and skills for more of the good of the profession. I took advantage of every opportunity to do better. That meant taking the time to extend, uh, excuse me, attend our like state chiropractic associations, district meetings and conventions, um, doing all those meetings and you know never missing the monthly meeting and participating. So as I was wrapping up that DICCP program, I was asked to put my name in for a board position on our state licensing board. I said yes, and ended up serving the full term of eight years. So during this time, I served a few years as chairperson. That meant I was able to participate in meetings um, for state licensing boards with the FCLB and the NBCE on a district and national level. I met a lot of wonderful colleagues along the way and with my meetings, and I'm still friends with many of them today. So during this last term on the Michigan board, I was asked if my name could be floated for a board position on the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners. Again, I said yes, and ended up serving for the board for that magic number, 13 years. <laughs> Throughout my term, I served on a lot of different committees and officers' positions, and as you heard earlier, in 2014, I was elected to be president. And since this was the first time a female doctor had ever held this position, I guess you could call it breaking the glass ceiling, but honestly, I was just working hard to do the best job I could. So I served as president for two, two years with my term ending last year and then became um, a board member for the nonprofit called Women Chiropractors. And then this year, of course, I started as a trustee here at Palmer College. Most importantly, what you need to know is my years of service have been an honor. These years have allowed me to expand my sphere of influence. And in fact, these opportunities have proven to be the backbone of my life. They have built a structure for me to pursue my goals, chances for me to learn, and to demonstrate leadership. So it was an opportunity for me to impact the profession. And it really sustains like my passion for chiropractic and keeping myself relevant in the field. Um, just currently, I only see patients two days a week, um, so it allows me to um, do a little bit of travel with that. And I, I work in an office with a couple other docs. Anyways. So way back in the mid-80s, when I was sitting in your seat, I never had a burning desire to participate at this level. Frankly, I didn't even think about it. Are you kidding? I was like you. I was trying to get through school. National boards, which I heard were last weekend for part four, and at that time we had state boards. And, you know, I was trying to get moved back to Michigan, find a position, and stop worrying about paying bills like student loans, which you may have heard of. Um, but anyways, I'm, I'm really confident I was like many of you. And by the way, I'm sure you never get over that worry part, worry part about paying bills. So here's the secret to my success, which is to say yes to opportunity. That's what I did. When opportunity came my way, I tested it out to see if it was a good fit. I said yes to each possibility, believing that this one opportunity might be life-changing. Of course, Chiropractic is not the only profession that struggles with equity and opportunity for women. I don't know if you were able to see it, but in September there was an article in Time Magazine that highlighted some female trailblazers. So they ranged from age 16 to 87, and the author, who is Nancy Gibbs, detailed these pioneers not only in public service but also private enterprise. They concentrated on following their dreams Often they were pioneering in spirit, always dedicated and passionate about what they were doing. So you may have heard of Mary Barra, 
who became CEO of a major car company. She held a lot of engineering and admin posts at GM. She started there at age 18, and in 2011, she was named Executive Vice President of Global Product Development. So throughout her years of service to GM, she also pursued her education. And her promotion to CEO of GM in 2005 or excuse me, 2015, was the pinnacle of her career. But sadly, she had to force issues like 84 recalls on safety uh, issues with GM. Then she was called to testify before the Senate and the safety of their products in general. Talk about grit. Talk about paying attention and realizing the importance of your work. Talk about saying yes to opportunity. She was not forced to say yes to any of those positions, but that was her lifelong pursuit. So here's how it's paid off. In 2016, she was listed as one of the world's most powerful women by Forbes magazine for the fifth time. So let's consider someone else, Eileen Collins. She was the first woman to command a space shuttle. She was born in New York daughter of immigrants from Ireland. And in childhood, she sold Girl Scout cookies like most of us did. But in the back of her mind, she always envisioned herself in space and becoming a pilot. Her educational path eventually took her to Stanford, and she earned a master's degree in space systems management. Ultimately, Eileen Collins was selected to be an astronaut in 1990 and first flew the space shuttle as a pilot in 1995. She earned the title of commander while leading NASA's return to flight mission to test safety improvements and to resupply the International Space Station. So, was Eileen Collins just a woman in the right place at the right time? Or was she more likely a person who worked hard, who held herself accountable, a person who took advantage of every opportunity to merge her passion for space and flying? Let's switch to chiropractic. And I would like to talk about Dr. Mabel Palmer. For me, Palmer College could not have chosen a more apt person to honor in the dedication of their Women's Institute. Dr. Mabel Palmer is known as, you heard, the first lady of chiropractic, and I heartily endorse the Institute of Women for honoring Dr. Palmer's devotion to the profession. Notice that I'm calling her Dr. Palmer because she attained that high level of education. Today I'm also highlighting this distinction between her achievements and that of her husband, Dr. B.J. Palmer. Dr. Mabel Palmer taught at Palmer for 35 years and was a trusted advisor to her husband. In fact, she was so loved and valued by her husband, BJ, he often claimed that she was seven, like seven eighths of his success was due to Mabel. In fact, according to history recorded here at Palmer, she helped to chart the early course of chiropractic. So in addition to her teaching duties, Including lecturing internationally, Dr. Palmer served as Palmer treasurer and business ma manager. She was an active civic leader. Dr. Palmer was a wife, a mother, a lecturer, a business manager, and author of a remarkable book on anatomy that I'll tell you a little bit more about later. And, and she was also devoted to the cause of advancing women in chiropractic. Just like many of you, Dr. Palmer spent the entirety of her life dedicated and passionate about what she was doing for the profession she loved. Dr. Palmer sounds a lot like you and me. She did it all. She was an expert at many things, and she loved variety, doing many different types of things, and, and she was paid for it most of the time. Last, she knew the world. She knew the world desperately needed chiropractic health care. Her devotion to the cause led her to say yes to every opportunity to promote chiropractic. She combined her profession with her vocation, with her life's mission, and passion for fulfilling her sense of purpose. Did she do it consciously? 
Did she spend time thinking about her real purpose in life? I doubt it. I think she was doing remarkable, able to do remarkable things because she acted on her desire to take advantage of every opportunity to advance the cause of chiropractic. Palmer acted on her ideas. And if you haven't seen this little pamphlet she put out, it's called Women's Appeal to Women. Women a, a Woman's Appeal to Women. The world needs thousands of women chiropractors. You can be successful and independent too as a Palmer School graduate chiropractor. In fact, Dr. Palmer was um, just constantly promoting women in chiropractic. And so it's important we absorb this philosophy because more and more women are entering the field and we must join with others if we are to succeed. So in 2015, the addition of the practice analysis of chiropractic reported that 73% of the chiropractic practitioners were male and 27% were female. The first year this survey was done, in 1991, it was reported that the profession was just 13.3% female chiropractors. And recently, the Association of Chiropractic Colleges reported evidence of a shift in, this, in our traditionally male-dominated profession. Enrollments across the colleges are about 50-50, and the ACA is predicting much more changes in the future. So this is my theory on the statistics I've just given you, is that we will not be successful unless we help one another. Let me give you an example of how important this principle is in a related organization. So several years ago, a few of my cousins, Dr. Cindy Schaff, Toll, and Dr. Nancy Elwertowski Cooper, um, were presenting during a Michigan chiropractic convention, and they realized there was so much discussion around the challenge of, challenges of multitasking for women. Both women realized they wanted a seat at the table when it came to figuring it out, when it came to addressing the needs of women in chiropractic. So they started a private Facebook page. They initially did it to kind of judge the hugeness of the problem, like just how many women struggling with multitasking and children and home and building a successful career. Their group started with a few hundred followers and they, we were quickly adding 100 a week, all by word of mouth, no advertising. So the, all these women are vetted. That means they are, we ensure that either they are licensed or they are documented um, students of chiropractic. So I'm on, this is the board I'm on, so I know a lot of the detail. And I'm really excited about the work we're doing in supporting women. Women Chiropractors is a nonprofit and it's launched from a collective dream of female chiropractors. We are inclusive, multi generational gathering of women. Our main goal is to support women chiropractors internationally so they can achieve their purpose and goals in a life defined by their success. Everybody's definition is different. It does not matter how much money you make or how many dollars you have in the bank. Success can mean many different things to different people. So let me read you their mission statement. We will educate and empower all women chiropractors in technique, human resources, philosophy, and life skills. Our goal is to help you connect to that purpose and to a sisterhood that supports you as you turn your purpose into action. Together we are committed to keeping our minds and hearts open to elevate women chiropractors and students by encouraging growth and igniting the change we want to see in the world. We honor Dr. Mabel Palmer, just so you know, by registering her birthday of June 5th with the National Day Calendar as National Women Chiropractors Day. So the success of women chiropractors is indeed a success story about the impact of social media and the ability we have to quickly connect with one another. At last count, there's over 5,000 followers. And in the last 28 days, over 4,000 of these women have interacted on the Facebook page in some way to help one another be successful. The thing we do best is to mentor, to answer questions, to direct people to information, and to pro provide support. We genu genuinely believe the whole, the sum of all, is better than our parts. Our long-term vision supports the thought that individual women are going to have to be more supportive of one another 
to be more involved, to share successes and failures with the single-minded goal that we will help one another to succeed. My pages are sticking. So in the beginning, I promised you some tips on how to make opportunities happen. My history validates that I did it by becoming more involved politically, by joining state associations, by being available for leadership roles, by committing to being present at the table when decisions are made. And I encourage the same path for you. Just say yes to opportunity. That's been my path. And I, I advocate that you develop habits that create and sustain your path to opportunity. So first, look for opportunities that give you a stretch. And assessing your challenges, you will form ideas and from those purposes, you must determine what is worth your time. What will you commit to following through? If we don't act on our ideas, we can't expect progress and eventual success. Secondly, be confident in yourself. Know who you are. Self-confidence is magnetic. It draws people to you. So do whatever it takes to become more confident in your ideas. So for example, you can offer suggestions at a meeting. Trust me, my board members think I offer way too many, but you never know when your idea might provide a solution or start a conversation towards a solution. Always choose to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Build on what you have to offer. If you are the best at some chiropractic technique, define it, describe it, advance it, make yourself the expert. If you are good at public speaking, try to gain every opportunity to speak. Do everything you can to gain credibility. Build on what works, but works for you. You are custom designing your life. So be careful not to advocate for or to build a path forward that does not align with your life goals. And take some calculated risk. Sometimes you have to take a little chance to uh, take advantage of an opportunity. It may not work, which is why I caution you to take a little risk. But if it does work, I think you'll thoroughly enjoy it. Look for opportunities. Look everywhere. An opportunity may be right in front of you. Just set your mind on the goal of finding opportunities. Changing your attitude is powerful. Support your colleagues. If chiropractic is not a success, then we will all suffer. Look around you and try to figure out how to help one another succeed. But be prepared to take the heat. Look, not everyone's going to agree with you. Not everyone is going to support you. Of course, that's the truth, but let it be their truth. Let your truth be about your goals, about the good you're trying to do. So you have to pick yourself up and move on. Always keep your mind focused on the pursuit of your goals. Pay attention to your environment. Curiosity is a worthy trait. Make it your goal to find out what others may miss. Make bold decisions. If you want to make a weekly commitment to be at your child's soccer game, don't halfway commit. And then feel guilty because you're leaving the office early. There is nothing wrong with determining to be the best mother or father you can be. Demonstrate that you can be counted on. What a powerful message to send to your child and to your colleagues. Express gratitude in all you do. This is contagious. It will demonstrate your ability to be reflective and to place emphasis only on those things that are truly important. So that's it. I've told you about myself and about the principles in life that I think are important, those that help me to be successful. So in closing, let me continue with a brief synopsis on the life of Dr. Mabel Palmer. In addition to being an influential woman in, woman in early chiropractic, Dr. Palmer was progressive in her thoughts and actions. Just recently, I learned that Dr. Mabel Palmer had a driver's license, something very rare for women of that era. Upon further expo exploration about Dr. Palmer, we know she graduated in 1905 from Palmer School of Chiropractic. She went on to Chicago to study anatomy and later joined Palmer faculty as professor in 1909. Dr. Palmer authored a textbook on chiropractic anatomy in 1920, which was updated through five editions. 
This textbook was used by most of the chiropractic colleges through the 1940s. And many view this book as a forerunner to the modern theoretical biology. So her book described the functional structures of anatomy from an interior dimension, describing the living system as intelligent. Her descriptions are viewed as precursors to autopoietic theory and systems theory. She described the inside view of the exterior structures of the body. Her deep knowledge and ability to share her learning in anatomy led her to become this long-time professor in anatomy and dissection. But she did not stop there. In 1928, the governor of Iowa appointed her to serve as state delegate to the Women's World's Fair in Chicago. She gained this honor by having previously received outstanding recognition in her chosen field of chiropractic. Her advocacy of women in chiropractic led her to be the first charger president of the first ever women's chiropractic organiz organization, the Sigma Phi Chi. She was active in civic leadership, where she continued to advocate for women. She was elected international president of Quota Club, which promoted gender equality and empowered women. And she formed the first Quota chapter in Australia. She was an accomplished writer, writing about her worldwide travels with BJ, as well as writing about the religions of the Orient and women of the Orient. I think Dr. Palmer is a fitting role model to all. In closing, we must not allow external pressures such as time, calendar obligations, and people's biases to hold us, us back professionally. We must be vigilant in realizing that each moment of our lives is an opportunity to care for ourselves, to care for our colleagues, and especially to care for our chosen profession, chiropractic. So now it's your turn. How do you think differently than you once did? What life experience or realization has created significant change on your way of thinking? What is the next thing you need to do to bring meaning and success to your life? Where will you begin? What opportunities will you say yes to? Thank you. No. <laughs> that was the answer I got at home all the time. You had to make your questions fit the answer of no, but go ahead. <laughs> you, you mentioned earlier that, um, that often you were the only woman you know, in, in the room at, um, when you started to do work with leadership in leadership roles. Is there any advice that you would have to both women and men about you know, how, to, how to best navigate that when that, when that happens? Well, I hope there is some day when a man is the only man chiropractor in a room full of women chiropractors, but I'm not sure I'm going to live to see that quite yet. But I will tell you, it's very intimidating. And even though there are people you know, and I'm going to use an example, it still just takes you back. So I um, was president of the National Board, and there was a meeting of the World Federation of Chiropractic that was going to be in Miami, and the ACC, which is the Chiropractic College presidents, were all meeting in Miami. <clears throat> excuse me, in Miami. So we decided that we would have our board meeting there, and we hosted a luncheon with the Chiropractic College presidents. And we're sitting around this room with you know 16 of them, 11 board members, an executive, a couple executive directors, and I look around and I am the only female at the table. It is very intimidating, and it just takes your breath away, and it's like, oh my gosh, fake it. Take a big, <laughs> deep breath and, and go on. And I, and I know them all. I know I've met them all previously, but it is kind of mind-blowing. It's like, really? I'm the only female in here? Seriously? Because at that time, Dr. Jean Moss, who was president of Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College, had retired. And, and to this day, we don't have a female college president. And I hope someday in the future that will change. But it is. It's very intimidating. Um, and like I said, I knew them all. Um, but um, the gentleman that was ACC president at that time was very gracious and kind of helped me along. And, and it ended up being a wonderful meeting. But I, I will tell you what was really 
cool in, from a female perspective is when I started the DICCP program, so I'm used to being the minority in a room, I walked into the first class and out of 66 people there were 45 to 50 women. And it was like, whoa, am I a chiropractic meeting here, you know? <laughs> so that was kind of cool. So. so see, any other questions? They want to go to class, that's what it is. <laughs> Have a great day, everybody.